Podcast. You're listening to 1232, an audio epic produced by Rumblestump Entertainment. Chapter 1 I have long lived for this my entire life. I have wanted nothing more than for the science of magic and the magic of science to combine into a force we mere mortals can touch. But I wonder, at what cost? I believe my life is in danger. They might even attempt to kill me. Hoffman, the helicopter pilot, seems to be the only one I can trust. I'm pressed for time and can't explain it now. My children, if you were reading this, one of two possibilities has occurred. Hoffman has carried out my request and smuggled this note to you, explaining the situation after my untimely death. Or, my prayers have been answered, and I have traveled to the Carol Stone. Please forgive me. I was not the father I should have been. I pray I may have a second chance, and that you both find purpose and peace. Your loving father, John. Present day. Rona sprang for the cable, swinging from the black helicopter's belly. Trying to clip into the harness, she slid her foot into the loop as the ground left her. Shaking, all thumbs, she couldn't get her carabiner to lock in. She lost her balance as the helicopter pulled upward into the early morning sky. She had made an error in her haste from being pursued by the irate security team on the ground. She slipped her combat boot all the way through the foot loop. Now, hanging like a rag doll, she would be raked through the oncoming treetops. She hollered as she tried to cover her head with her arms. The path of the chopper dragged her through the boughs of a giant tree, and another, and another. The last branch cracked a rib or two. This unavoidable lesson would leave a mark. Every muscle strained while the men in the helicopter hauled her in. Are you all right, Thatcher? Briggs shouted above the noise. Yeah, but Rogers, he... Rona yelled back, breathless. Her team leader, Cummins, asked, Why the indifferent attitude? Rogers just died right in front of me. She couldn't sort it out. Cummins furrowed his brow as he grabbed the backpack from her. She got the hint, albeit brutal and unfeeling. Her hands were still shaking, and she couldn't help the fear that rose from her stomach to her throat. Training is over. Fine! I'm fine! Rona shouted back with an unmistakable edge in her tone and gave a thumbs up. Adrenaline was still shooting its vicious liquid through every limb. Looking out, she watched the snow-covered Sierra Nevada de Santa Martas as they flew past her. The rising sun danced on their peaks, leaving the shadows to the gloomy Colombian jungle that spread below. She had caught her breath, when she felt the throbbing in her ribcage and noticed her elbow had a sizable gash. Do you need medical attention? Briggs threw her a sarcastic look. Rona unzipped her jacket and inspected the crusted blood and injuries that were already bruising. When we get back to base, I'm fine. She reassured him. He gave her a sideways glance and grinned at Cummins. Initiation. But Rona muted her radio receiver while Briggs' voice continued. He always got under her skin. The chopper turned north to the next landing site. They would hit the airstrip in a couple of hours, then back to Black Dagger headquarters on U.S. soil. Rona ripped open a pain reliever pill pack and swallowed them. One more mistake could have killed me. Her eyes widened, but the erratic drumbeat of her heart had finally slowed. The next airstrip, a crudely cut grassy field, had a single engine plane, a pilotus PC-12, warmed up and ready to go. The Black Dagger unit boarded the gutted turboprop without ceremony. Cummins put on his headset, and over the comms, briefed their commander on the situation. Man, I can't believe that good. Black Dagger was no longer on friendly terms with their most recent client, and Rogers? had been dealt a deadly shot. You see that? That was a cluster of fire solid. Yeah. And then you bring somebody like that and plug it into our team? Oh, there was something wrong with that. I guess I'm the lucky one. 
Rona's guilty thoughts responded as she overheard fragments of the conversation with base command. Cummins shot Rona several concerned looks, nodding emphatically. As her pain became less acute, she recapped the previous night's events. Where had she and Rogers gone wrong? She closed her eyes and let the memories replay. Despite her commander's new disregard for her teammate and the obvious mistakes made, she would still need a solid answer at the debriefing. She knew how to keep a straight face, even under pressure. Rona snapped out of her reverie, plunging her hand into her vest pocket as the plane ascended. She relaxed with a sigh of relief. The bracelet was still there. She remembered her partner, Rogers, had been taking papers out of a safe and stuffing them in his pack. She remembered the temptation to snatch the bracelet on an impulse. In the space of a second, she had noticed their tech support team had not only disabled the entry alarm, but had unlocked several glass display cases containing opulent jewelry. While Rogers was hanging the painting back on the wall over the safe he had plundered, Rona's eyes had strayed to the diamond bracelet lying delicately on the velvet. She had snatched it as Rogers ran past her, hoping he had not noticed. That had to be what set off the alarm. Rona rubbed her forehead. The blaring alarm had gone off in immediate response to her ill-advised snatch. Over their handheld radios, they followed new instructions to a service entrance out the back. That's when things got crazy. Rogers peeled out, running for his life as gunfire ricocheted off the steel staircase. In the heat of that moment, as Rona recalled it, she wondered. What did Rogers take? Why had he insisted on opening the safe? That objective was not in the briefing. Strange, she thought. Thinking nothing of her ill-advised action to steal from her client. The next memory hurt her stomach as she recalled seeing Rogers jerk and hit the ground in front of her. They had shot him. Rona had grabbed his pack in pure panic and lit out as fast as she could for the hole in the chain link fence they had cut earlier to get into the compound. As she made the extraction point, the helicopter topped over the trees and let down the cable. Now, she had to get her story straight and not on her life would she mention the bracelet. Rogers was dead, and though this made her sick, she couldn't be caught stealing on this mission. When they arrived at headquarters, just outside of Las Cruces, New Mexico, 24 hours later, there was a medic waiting to inspect Rona's wounds. The cut on her right cheek and elbow would need special attention. Getting slapped about by the trees had also given her a black eye and plenty a freshly red, scraped, irritated skin on her sides and legs. Her left side looked like a child's finger painting gone wrong, her rib cage every color. The medic's gloved hands made suction sounds as he prodded her injuries. He shook his head. Yep. You've got two cracked ribs and a hairline fracture on the third here. Rona winced. She could handle a lot of physical pain, but that didn't mean it didn't hurt. These bottom two could easily puncture a lung if you don't let them heal properly. Pretty risky. You should stay down until tomorrow. Okay, I'm dying. I get it. You've scared me enough. Rona cut the medic off. I know about the dangers of broken bones. Stitch me up. I gotta get to the debriefing. The medic snapped his gloves off and exasperatedly turned, implying for Rona to follow him to the medical building. These hot-headed recruits, nothing but trouble. He said under his breath. Black Dagger ran an all-inclusive private security company for its clients and its employees. If an employee was hurt, a regular occurrence from most assignments, Black Dagger medical personnel tended them there. While the medic put stitches in her elbow and a butterfly bandage on her face, Rona figured she was succeeding at something. Or at least climbing the ladder, a far cry from where she started a year ago. This mission was her ticket to get in Eclipse. Becoming a part of the elite unit would be her last hurdle. An opportunity to make real money. Just two years prior, 
they had recruited her from her gym in Albuquerque, where she was training earnestly in mixed martial arts. Lewis, the Eclipse team leader, approached her right after her biggest victory, but before she had made a complete wreck of her life. To Lewis, she stood out for being a survivor, willing to go the distance and win. Those were traits Black Dagger valued, and they offered her a job, a rookie hire. The mouthy redhead, with sharp green eyes and skin that turned red in the sun, put little stock in friendly relations. Black Dagger offered a home for all her ills. For now. After the death of her mother, her home and family fragmented. She had a twin brother named Flint, but for several years, Flint hadn't heard a word from her, even when she heard their father had disappeared. They didn't even know where she worked or what happened to her MMA career. She didn't know what they were up to either. She liked it that way. Fewer distractions. And her difficult family members were easier to deal with from a distance. After debriefing with the team, Rona found herself in hot water. The assignment hadn't gone according to plan. All the more reason to keep her mouth shut. Lewis, always a menacing presence, instructed her to go to the boss's office afterward. Why was Lewis in the briefing? That wasn't an Eclipse mission. Rona questioned his involvement and mindfully logged that information. Rona swaggered down the hall and knocked on an office door. From behind it, a booming voice invited her in. Sit down. He said dryly. Rona obeyed. She wasn't sure what to expect from Boss Kellum. He ran Black Dagger as an old career military man would, but Eclipse was his personal army, his private gang of ex-military mercenaries. He may have built Black Dagger a reputation for providing security for the ultra-rich and safe escort for businessmen in South America, but on the side, Eclipse did the dirty work. Everything from black market arms deals, kidnapping, blackmail, and even carrying out hits for the highest bidder. Anything to stretch the limits of what an honest American company was known for. Boss Callum leaned back in his squeaky chair and played with a cigar in his mouth. In his late 60s, the boss was still a massive man. He had built the company into a full-scale training complex and a seemingly legitimate business that had the makings of a small empire. He talked slowly. His deep, bellowing voice made the large office feel small. I hired you because you got that ruthless quality about you. You don't care what people think. You keep your mouth shut. And Lewis led me to believe that you had skills to go along with the attitude. And that's why I let you in on this mission. But now I'm wondering. He raised his tone. I'm wondering if you have the follow through. He lit his cigar. To keep things confidential. Leaning forward onto his desk, every inch littered with maps and folders, he looked Rona square in the eye. She glared right back at him, unaffected. The point he was trying to make confused her, but she didn't show it. She had learned a thing or two about intimidation. Kellum blew cigar smoke right in Rona's face making her squint. Rookie or not, I expect your unconditional cooperation, Thatcher. I've heard you've got a short fuse. Well, so do I. I don't like a loose tongue or a weak mental disposition. Just remember that what happens out there stays out there. As long as you keep quiet, you've got nowhere to go but up in this company. Then he smiled. You just keep one thing in mind. I'm the boss. His smile melted to a grimace. I know you've got a record. If you cross me, I'll see that the authorities get a better look at it. Understand? Prove you're a team player, and we won't worry about it. I'll make sure you get your fair share. He got up and opened the door in mock courtesy. Rona bristled as she walked past him. She hated being indebted to others. It always meant more trouble. 
Anyone pulling the strings on her life meant she wasn't living on her own the way she wanted to. He'll never blow the whistle on me. Surely it would mean exposing everyone else, too. More tests? I want an eclipse. It's the right move, isn't it? She wouldn't entertain the idea that she made poor decisions in life. Little did she know the power Callum had over her. He kept all his employees on a tight leash, except for Lewis. They had an understanding. These men weren't messing around, though, and any shred of doubt posed a threat. Rona had no grasp of what kind of business she was in. She stayed in a perpetual state of ill temper and restiveness. This appeared to serve her well in the past, but she didn't see the damage she caused with that constant attitude. In high school, Rona had won several kickboxing tournaments and steadily climbed the ranks in her division. She began, but never completed, several varieties of mixed martial arts, including Muay Thai. Not quite mastering them fully, but she still won multiple matches from sheer will and stubbornness. Winning went to her head, put a chip on her shoulder. Never responding well to coaching, Rona believed she knew everything about competitive fighting from day one. At 20, she was living in the Southwest training and quickly got to the top of the Batam weight class in her gym where she bandied her pride like a badge, pissing most people off. Rona gravitated to the wrong friends that had their own interests in mind. On over one occasion, they had involved her in gang assault and theft. The cops let her off, being the youngest and the female of the bunch. But she tested the limits of their leniency and earned a poor reputation. She made decent money as an opener for MMA events in town. When she showed the right mentality, She attracted decent coaches, but she went through them quickly after they learned she was a temperamental fighter. No control, no patience, and little evidence of any humility proved her undoing. A year later, she had a lucky streak with better fights, picking the nickname The Rager. Her last fight was her television debut out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, in the Octagon, with another up-and-comer, Annie the Angel Harper a promising athlete from Ogden, Utah. Feeder league scouts were looking for the next up-and-coming UFC superstars. When the two women came to the ring, both had been in a skirmish pre-fight. Harper had a black eye and Rona a bloody lip. The judges took note. Three brutal rounds and a knockout later, Rona spat blood from her mouth guard and raised both fists in the air as the victor. But the next day, a video surfaced of her and Harper fighting at a party the night before, silencing her UFC hopes forever. The clip showed evidence of drug and alcohol abuse, obvious violations of the fighter's code. Ignorant of the lines of coke, bongs, and beer bottles on the table in the room, they caused a stir with the Utah athlete's parents and associates. Lawsuits from Harper followed. Lewis from Black Dagger, Rona's recruiter, had come along just in time. The company offered to get her a talented lawyer, advance her salary, and train her on the spot. How could she refuse? She always wondered why they would take a washout, but figured her best quality was keeping her mouth shut. She didn't ask too many questions. Rona still wanted to clear her name, however, and resented being forced out of Albuquerque. Looking over her shoulder all the time, made her irritable. In the headquarters garage, she popped more pain meds, hopped on her trusty Yamaha R6, and headed down the highway to Anthony, Texas, where there was a seedy gym that took all comers in all combative styles. She knew she could get a fight there. The open signs flickered in the evening glow, but the parking lot was crowded. Good, she thought. The money is here. An hour later, Rona was in the cage with a local Latina girl starting the third round. The crowd booed. Both women had come out early with all they had, and the last round was mostly clinches, with Rona the only one landing any blows. She liked to keep it standing up because her combinations were lethal quick jabs. A roundhouse probably would have finished this girl, but Rona's pain meds were wearing off, and she could feel the broken ribs piercing into her side. 
Her injuries crippled her resolve. She couldn't do any more high kicks. Bloody and overheated, she went for a takedown. Her ground game wasn't great, but that didn't matter when she lost her cool. 30 more seconds led to a naked rear choke and the girl submitted. Afterwards, when Rona came out to her bike, an agitated mob waited for her. Her opponent's friends were not there to show good sportsmanship. Exhausted, Rona held her own, so they began breaking all the rules of a fair fight. Overcome by sheer numbers, they knocked her down and kicked her relentlessly. The gym owner broke them up after catching sight of the skirmish from his office window. Hey, 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 break it up, break it up, break it up. I'm keeping the bike till this blows over. He shoved Rona inside his wrecked Toyota and dropped her off at Black Dagger's gate. He didn't have any love for Rona, the red-headed hellion, or the company she worked for. She staggered to her room and tried to ice the soreness. When it got quiet, Rona's choices seemed to close in on her. Her life felt empty, pointless. She fought her fears back, but her options continued to be limited. A fitful sleep at last overpowered her. We're going to take just a minute to hear from our awesome sponsors who make this show possible. Then we'll get back to the show. This episode of 1232 is sponsored in part by Oasis Family Media and its family of companies including Oasis Audio, Enclave Publishing, and Sky Turtle Press. Publishers of the forthcoming epic Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen. Rendered in modern prose by Rebecca K. Reynolds and illustrated by Justin Girard. For more information, visit fairyqueen.com. That's fairyqueen.com. Or find the link in the description below. We interrupt this episode to bring you a quick word from our sponsors. Is your tea in the cupboard boring? Is the coffee you buy from the grocery store expensive and crappy? It's time you use our promo code 1232 for 32% off your first order of quality tea and coffee from atticustea.com. That's 1232 for 32% off your first order at atticustea.com. Hello, 1232 listeners. This is Callie Sue, and I'm excited to tell you about Dramafy, the ultimate platform for creators and fans of audio dramas. With oodles of genres, hundreds of shows, and thousands of episodes, Dramafy is your go-to streaming service exclusively for family-friendly audio dramas. Whether you're a devoted listener or a creator of a family-friendly masterpiece, Dramafy has something for you. And guess what, 1232 listeners? You can now enjoy 1232 on Dramafy. Just go to dramafy.com forward slash 1232. That's D-R-A-M-A-F-Y dot slash 1232 and get started for free. Happy listening. And now, back to the show. All of Black Dagger's employees lived on a site when they weren't on assignment. Rona woke up on the couch, stiff and sore. Light glared through the curtains in the repurposed motel room. The run-down motel served as barracks for the complex. She lifted the blanket to see her ribs taped up and the knuckles on her left hand. A shoddy job. She laughed at herself, then swiftly clutched her ribs. Oh! Ow! I must have done that last night. I didn't realize I was that beat up. Did a drunk do this? Her elbow had bled on the couch, too. Oh, man. She moaned. Where's the coffee? She slowly sat up, taking shallow, gasping breaths. The phone rang, surprising her. (laughs) What the? (laughs) She grabbed the phone like a zombie. Is this Miss Rona Thatcher? A dry, secretarial voice said with a thick Spanish accent. Yeah, Rona said, gasping again, feeling how swollen her face was now. She sounded stopped up from her bloody nose. She sniffed to clear it and almost dropped the phone from the shooting pain in her nasal passages. 
This is Mandy from Sanchez and Galloway Attorneys at Law in Dallas, Texas. Mr. J. Galloway is scheduled to read John Thatcher's will on June 30th. Does this day work for you? Um, what? Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Rona clenched the phone and put it to her ear again. Whatever, look, fill me in a bit, will you? What happened? I have to be where on June 30th? Why? <sighs> Under the conditions in your father's will, Miss Thatcher, we require you and your brother to be present in our office for the reading of the will. Authorities agree that the provisions in the will can be carried out now, although Dr. Thatcher's body has not been found. Your brother has requested that we execute the will. Are you in agreement, Miss Thatcher? Sure, whatever. Rona's head was pounding now. After getting the details, she hung up and got a mug of coffee. No wonder I've had all those messages on my voicemail. Flint must have finally tracked down my number. She mused as she sipped from her cup. Her swollen and bruised face showed little emotion, even now. But under the surface, her emotions shifted and jammed together. Thinking of Flint and her father touched that old nerve that made her incensed with resentment. It also made her think of her mother. Grief, like an old friend embraced her mind. I'm glad she can't see me now. Rona's desperation locked her thoughts away. She leaned against the couch and tried to take normal breaths. She dared not think about it, but she felt herself slipping. It was hard to comprehend, but she knew she was sliding past a point of no return, and nothing could call her back. She knew... She should care more about whatever happened to her dad. She wanted to care, but the feelings wouldn't come. Rona was numb. But it would pass, as always. She would just swallow hard and go on attacking life. Getting into a comfortable position, she glanced at the calendar on her phone. It was June 28th. She would have to book her flight from El Paso to Dallas today and hope her bank account could handle it. Suddenly... Her eyebrows rose in excitement. Groaning, she struggled to her feet and staggered over to rummage around in the pile of clothing and gear on her bed. The room looked an utter mess, with empty pizza boxes, piles of laundry, and mildew in the old motel bathroom from lack of cleaning. Aha! There's my lucky vest. She pulled a diamond bracelet out of the pocket of a muddy black vest and held it up. A plane ticket and perhaps other luxuries, wouldn't be a problem for her account. This trip comes at a good time, she thought as she got up to begin some semblance of daily life. Black Dagger frequently faced investigation from the feds. Underhandedness was a constant, but this was different. Rona was going to stay as far away from it as possible. Leaving her room, Rona needed to ask permission for time off. Walking the length of the complex, she bumped into a co-worker, a member of Eclipse. A shy man from somewhere in the United Kingdom, Rona assumed. He wasn't Irish, didn't have an English accent, and, unfortunately, he wasn't a Scottish heartthrob. His name was Taff, and he was the only person there who had a reasonable face. A somber one, laced with worry lines, but it still portrayed a kindness. Handsome, in a sad sort of way, Taff was graying prematurely at only 29 years old. His wavy hair, broad shoulders, and six-foot frame contrasted his meek manner. He had a polite smile, on the rare occasions he used it. Rona knew him fairly well. Her first day on base, she had met him and mysteriously fell into conversation with him. It took time, but he eventually would stop and talk with her willingly now. He had been at Black Dagger three years before she came on board. Rona liked him. He liked her too, but never made a move. So Rona didn't either. Taft stood looking up at the Oregon Mountains. Their rocky, jagged edges serrated the sky. He often was gazing at them, staring ever east. Taft, what's up? You don't look good. He smiled faintly. Always know how to flatter a girl. Yeah. Bit of a fight last night at the gym. I won, Rona sighed. But she had some pretty loyal friends, if you know what I mean. Rona. He was about to lay into her with one of his counseling rants, as Rona referred to them. 
Oh, I'm good. It's all good. A little banged up. Hey, I gotta get out of town, but the gym owner impounded my bike. Could you give me a ride to the airport on Monday? Of course. He bowed. A strange habit that he had. Rona never quite understood it, but liked the way it made her feel. Great. Just gotta clear some personal time and make a quick trip to the pawn shop. Rona winked and sauntered off. You're listening to 1232, an audio epic produced by Rumble Stomp Entertainment. Written by Callie Sue and Cheyenne Bell. Today's voice talents include Mark Wengerin as John Thatcher, Robin Cage as Rona Thatcher, Matt Burke as Taff, Floyd Goodlow as Boss Kellum, Garrett LeMay as The Medic, Cheyenne Landry as Mandy, Walt Evans as Commander Cummins, and Jet Black as Briggs. Edited by KC Caballero, Caballero Sounds. Music by Rumble Stump Entertainment, with Rona's theme, Warrior, by Robin Cage. <laughs>